Madden, I need you to come here. What's going on? Oh my. The next problem has appeared. Construct the complex numbers from the real numbers. What a mysterious problem. Sindaman, what do you think? Seems like a piece of cake. Really? Are you sure? A complex number is represented by A plus B I. Here A and B are real numbers, so we can construct complex numbers with real numbers. Oh, I see. Sindaman, we have the imaginary unit I here. We need to construct this with real numbers. What? Really? But even if you say that, I is used because we can't represent it with real numbers. Well, it can be tricky if you don't know. There are several ways to construct the complex numbers using the real numbers. Today I'll introduce a method using matrices, which is intuitive to understand. Please go ahead. Let's think in terms of the complex plane. We take the real axis horizontally, and the imaginary axis vertically. Multiplying 1 by i rotates at 90 degrees counterclockwise to i, and multiplying by i again, rotates at another 90 degrees to negative 1. So multiplying by i twice is the same as multiplying by negative 1. Oh, I remember that. This holds true for any complex number. Multiplying a plus b i by i gives negative b plus a i. You can see this 90 degree rotation by considering right triangles like this. If you're interested, pause and think about it. Now let's move on. The vector a b corresponding to a plus b i rotates 90 degrees counterclockwise to negative b a. Can we represent this 90 degree rotation using a matrix? Um, let's see. For the first row, we can do this to get negative B. Next, for the second row, if we do this, we get A. Now we've represented a 90 degree rotation. That's right. So we can consider this matrix to represent the imaginary unit I. It's kind of mysterious. By the way, the general rotation matrix for an angle theta looks like this. If we consider theta to be 90 degrees, we can see that it matches this matrix. Oh, I see. So this matrix is a special case of the rotation matrix. And since all its elements are real numbers, we can indeed say we've constructed I using real numbers. Well, maybe it's too soon to say we've really constructed it for sure. If you're not sure, let's check it out. We denote the identity matrix as E and the matrix corresponding to the imaginary unit as J. Now what will J squared look like? Let's see. For now let's line up two J matrices. Since we need to consider the matrix multiplication, let's break them down like this. First, let's focus on this part. We multiply 0 by 0 to get 0, then negative 1 by 1 to get negative 1. So the top left element is 0 plus negative 1, which is negative 1. If we calculate the others similarly, we get this. We can write this as negative E, using the identity matrix E. Thanks, Sundaman. To summarize, J squared equals negative E. This corresponds to I squared equals negative 1, in the world of complex numbers. Yes, it seems that J represents the imaginary unit I. It feels strange to have a number whose square is negative. But in the world of matrices, it's surprisingly easy to create such a thing. Now we are all set. Just as 1 corresponds to E, I corresponds to J. So any complex number A plus B I corresponds to the matrix A E plus B J. If we write the elements of E and J specifically, the matrix corresponding to A plus B I looks like this. Let's check if this correspondence between complex numbers and matrices is valid. Zundaman, try calculating this first. Sure, it's just a simple multiplication of complex numbers. First multiplying these gives 6i, and multiplying these gives 3i squared. Since i squared is negative 1, this part becomes negative 3, and then we just add 6i to it. Yes, exactly. So far, this has just been complex number calculation. Now let's calculate the corresponding matrix. Using this form you can calculate just like with complex numbers. Let's try it out. The matrix corresponding to this complex number expression looks like this. Then, just like with complex numbers, first multiplying these gives 6ej, and multiplying these gives 3j squared. 
We know j squared equals negative e, so it becomes this. Since e is the identity matrix, this e cancels out. So just like with complex numbers, the corresponding matrix calculation works, and the results match perfectly. Indeed, it looks like this matrix truly represents a complex number. That was a specific example, but the same applies in general. When we prepare matrices corresponding to complex numbers, z sub 1 and z sub 2, addition of matrices corresponds to addition of complex numbers. And multiplication of matrices corresponds to multiplication of complex numbers. To prove this rigorously, we might need to separate the real and imaginary parts. But it does seem to work, just like in the previous calculation. Okay, let's look at some properties of the matrix that correspond to a complex number. First, let's take the transpose of this matrix. Transposing means swapping rows and columns, right? Since we're dealing with a 2x2 two two matrix, in the transposed matrix, B and negative B are swapped. That's true. Do you know what this represents? What this represents, well... Boom, by swapping B and negative B, we change the sign of B. In the world of complex numbers, this means flipping the sign of the imaginary part. So does it correspond to the complex conjugate? You're right. It's interesting how the transpose of the matrix corresponds to the complex conjugate. Now, let's calculate the determinant of this. That's easy. The determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix is... You multiply these two elements, then subtract the product of these two elements. So the result is this. That looks correct. In the world of complex numbers, this corresponds to the square of the absolute value. It's fascinating how the determinant relates to the absolute value. Wow, today's problem was solved quickly. Zundaman, it looks like there's more. What? What do you mean? What is this? There's no explanation at all. It's a strange matrix. It looks similar to the matrix representing a complex number, but each element is a complex number. And here complex conjugates are used. So what does this matrix represent? I want to investigate it. Here the complex numbers alpha and beta are separated into real and imaginary parts. Let's use them. First if we write the real and imaginary parts of alpha, it looks like this. If we do the same to the remaining parts, we get this. First, let's extract the A part. It can be written using the identity matrix like this. We extract the B part in the same way. A matrix that somewhat resembles the identity matrix appears. Next, let's perform the same operation for C and D. Now we have all. Looking closely at this matrix, it matches the matrix representing the imaginary unit we discussed earlier. Oh, you're right! So what are the remaining two matrices? Let's continue investigating. For now, let's name these four matrices. We'll call the identity matrix E, as we did before. And we'll name the others sequentially as E sub 1, E sub 2, and E sub 3. Here, E sub 2 is the matrix representing the imaginary unit. We already know that squaring it results in negative E and the remaining two also result in negative E1 squared. What? That was fast, I can't keep up with the calculations. So what do we do from here? Zundaman, look at this. What is it now? Ah, uh, what is this? Once again, there's no explanation at all. This is really puzzling. I remember now, this is a quaternion. Quaternion? A, B, C, and D are real numbers. If you extract this part, it matches a complex number. Now that you mention it, it does. But there isn't just one imaginary unit. There are three, i, j, and k. And squaring each of these gives negative one. Additionally, i, j, and k satisfy these relations. A number that can be expressed in this form using i, j, and k is called a quaternion. That's new to me. And there are so many relations, it's complicated. Yes, it looks complicated at first glance. But actually, from these basic relations, we can derive all the other relations. Oh, really? Just a quick note. With real and complex numbers, you can multiply in any order. But as you can see here, that's not the case for quaternions. We need to be careful with the order of multiplication involving different imaginary units. 
By the way, there's something that's been bothering me. Yes. These are the matrices we defined. The first one is the identity matrix. And the remaining three seem to represent the imaginary units of quaternions. You felt it too, didn't you? Yes. These matrices satisfy the same relations as the imaginary units of quaternions. Similarly, we can derive the remaining relations from these basic ones. It's as if the flow of the conversation had been planned in advance. May I continue? This means that a matrix written in this form represents a quaternion. If we trace back our calculations, we can express it in this way. And if we define alpha and beta as follows, we can write it as a matrix of complex numbers. Just as we constructed the complex numbers from the real numbers, we've now constructed the quaternions from the complex numbers. You might have noticed it, but the matrix corresponding to a quaternion has complex numbers as its elements. So if we represent each element by a 2x2 two two real matrix, we get a 4x4 four four real matrix like this. Wow, something amazing just appeared. This matrix is made up of four 2x2 two two matrices. Using the concept of block matrices, we can treat this 4x4 four four matrix as a matrix whose elements are 2x2 two two matrices. So, from what we've discussed, we can think of this 4x4 four four matrix as representing a quaternion using real numbers. What a mysterious matrix. We constructed the complex numbers from the real numbers and the quaternions from the complex numbers. The ability of matrices to represent things is amazing. In fact, there is a concept called hypercomplex numbers that encompasses these. There are various kinds of hypercomplex numbers. For example, one of them is called the octonians. However, octonians cannot be represented by matrices. We can't use the same approach? That's a bit disappointing. Yes, it is disappointing, but it's also interesting that octonians cannot be represented by matrices, isn't it? Well, maybe you're right. So, what did you think of today's discussion? I was wondering if imaginary numbers really exist, but seeing how the complex numbers can be constructed from the real numbers feels like one possible answer to that question. Well then, take care everyone. See you later.